In this video, we will talk about trematodes, also known as flukes. Luckily, there's only two different trematodes that you need to know. The first is schistosoma species, and you know, technically there's two or three of those, but they all fall within one category. And then Clonorchis sinensis. So let's get started by talking about the different type of schistosoma. There are schistosoma hematobium, schistosoma japonicum, and schistosoma mansoni. Now luckily on exams, on USMLE and COMLEX, the only thing that you need to know about differentiating these subtypes of schistosoma is where the spine is located between hematobium and mansoni. And so if you look here, what you'll notice on the left side of the slide, schistosoma hematobium has a terminal spine marked by the red arrow, whereas schistosoma mansoni has a lateral spine marked by a blue arrow. Now don't ask me why this is the highest yield piece of information, but on exams, this is what they like to test on. So if you know that hematobium is terminal and mansoni is lateral, you're good to go. And the way that you can memorize this is that tobium is terminal. Hematobium, the T in tobium, tobium is terminal. And if tobium is terminal, terminal, then by the process of elimination, mansoni must be lateral. You don't even have to worry about japonicum because it just doesn't show up. Now, the bulk of what you need to know about schistosoma is about schistosoma hematobium. So again, once you know the difference in the spine, you can kind of throw out the other subtypes from your brain and just focus on memorizing what you need to know about schistosoma hematobium. The host is the bulinus snail. Pathophysiologically, the way that this works is that schistosoma hematobium likes to feed on the erythrocytes in urogenital organs. And the reason that it chooses those urogenital organs is because they tend to be highly vascular, therefore having more erythrocytes for the hematobium to feed off of. And then when the eggs get released, they get released and move through the urogenital system, ultimately becoming urinated out, and then the whole life cycle continues. Clinically, hematobium causes hematuria, and it's in the name, heme, more specifically, hemat. Hematobium causes hematuria. Okay, so if you can recall that we're talking about blood in the urine, hematobium causes hematuria. Now of note, very high yield to know, this is the second leading cause of bladder cancer worldwide. And specifically, it increases the risk for squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. That's a very high yield fact because on your exam, they could show you a picture of, of schistosoma hematobium, give you that terminal spine, and then ask you which of the following the patient is uh, potentially predisposed to. And the answer is gonna be bladder cancer. Symptoms wise, you wanna be on the lookout for dysuria, painful hematuria, urinary obstruction, can also cause vaginal discharge, pain or bleeding after intercourse. In women of childbearing age, it can cause issues with reproduction, so spontaneous abortion, ectopic pregnancy, dysmenorrhea, and intermenstrual bleeding. And then randomly, and I wrote random because this kind of doesn't fit with the mold of all of these um, urinary and obstetric issues, they can also cause pulmonary hypertension. But big takeaway here, it's in the name, hema, hema hematobium. Hematobium causes hematuria. And then if you can remember blood in the urine, take that one step further and ask yourself which cancer is most regionally related to urogenital problems. And that's gonna be squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. So the way that I remember schistosoma hematobium is I remember pistosoma hematobium. Piss helps me remember urogenital symptoms. And then the hema in hematobium helps me remember hematuria and bladder cancer and all that fun stuff. So that's schistosoma hematobium. And then again, just to repeat myself, tobium is terminal. Schistosoma hematobium is the one with the terminal spine. Let's conclude by talking about Clonorchis sinensis. So human infection occurs when humans eat raw or undercooked freshwater fish, typically in the form of fillets, shishimi, or kanji. Pathophysiology here, the Clonorchis sinensis lives within the biliary tree of humans. And so what happens here is that the worm 
gets into the biliary tree that causes sort of like a mass effect resulting in bile stasis it promotes bacterial growth it promotes inflammation and you get recurrent cholangitis now clinically because the clinorchis is living in the biliary tree all of your symptoms are going to be related to the biliary system so you'll see cholecystitis cholangitis and it's increasing the risk for cholangiocarcinoma now i want to pause here because this is really important not only is this high yield but you want to differentiate this with hematobium so i told you that hematobium increases the risk for squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder clinorchis sinensis also increases the risk but this time it increases the risk for a different cancer and it's cholangiocarcinoma so both of these pathogens increase the risk for a certain type of cancer very very high yield be able to differentiate that and be able to associate them in your brain now colonorchus sinensis is associated with pigmented gallstones acutely you could see cholangitis jaundice right upper quadrant abdominal pain nausea vomiting anorexia malaise and fevers more chronically, this is associated with pancreatitis and liver abscesses, and something that has become increasingly high yield on exams is that Clonorchis sinensis increases the risk for E. coli-mediated ascending cholangitis. So yes, it can cause cholangitis in and of itself. However, Clonorchis sinensis infection will also increase the risk for an E. coli-mediated ascending cholangitis infection and that's really high yield again you want to be able to connect these things in your brain because as you might be seeing there's lots of opportunities for third order questions where a test writer can connect all of these things and then ask you questions so perhaps they give you information about clonorchis and then they ask you which of the following bacterial pathogens does this increase the risk of infection with and so you start with a question about clonorchis sinensis you end with an answer having something to do with e coli very very important lastly the treatment for both schistosoma and clonorchis is praziquantel but that's it keep up the good work